Income inequality, the next big lie, that is the topic of tonight's byline. Parliament resumes next week, and if my hunch is right, you are about to be sold a big lie. Canada's crisis of income inequality. Your kids are already probably being sold this lie at school, told that the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Maybe your friends and family on Facebook have tried to sell you this lie as well with a, a popular viral video. It's called Wealth Inequality in America. It's been seen by more than 14 million people around the world, lots of them in Canada. And you know what? It confirms all that's bad about America, that the rich are really rich and the poor are really poor. There's a lot wrong with that video, including lots of lies. But the lies of the video, the lies of the people trying to sell you on income inequality don't matter to them. They have a goal. That goal is transformation. I need you to pay attention tonight. I need you to share this with your friends so that as the claim that we have an income inequality crisis in Canada is made, that you will know the truth and so will those around you. The NDP and the Liberals and much of the media, well, they've been beating the inequality drum for some time. Know this, the goal is always the same, socialism taking more of your money, giving it to someone else. Socialism is the transformation that they want, whether we're talking about the Liberals, the NDP, the people behind the video, or the Occupy Wall Street types. They claim the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and we need to fix this. The government must do something. Do they have a point? No. The government spends a lot of time looking into this issue. Bureaucrats are always looking for ways to redistribute money for reasons of what they see as fairness. But the facts at this point, well, they won't help them. Check out this report from Employment and Social Development Canada. It says the well-being of Canadian families depends on both their level of income and the distribution of income within the population. Differences in the distribution of income or income disparities are often considered a measure of society's fairness. Okay, are things fair? Are the poor really losing ground? Well, the first chart in this report shows an interesting picture. It details the average after-tax income of Canadians by income group, and it does it using constant $2,011. That way we can compare apples to apples. So between 1976 and 2011, the bottom 20% saw their incomes increase by 12.7%. Remember, this is all using 1970 or using $2,012. They converted figures from 1976 on into $2,012. So inflation and all those other factors are accounted for. That means the bottom 20% saw a real rise of 12.7%. The middle 60% saw a 23.2% increase. That's, that's significant. Now, the chart also shows that the top 20% got a boost of 37%. Is that a problem? I don't think so, and I'll show you why in a moment. But this chart blows away the idea that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The truth is everyone's getting richer and just some people are getting more richer. Let's look at the average family income over the same time period. This chart, again, from the same report. It shows that everyone is also getting richer. Once again, using constant $2,011, we can see that everyone's boat is rising. In 1976, the average after-tax family income for the bottom 20% was $12,000. The middle 60% was $30,567. And the top 20% had an average family income of $62,400. Go to 2011, the bottom 20% is up to 16,000 or a 33% increase. The middle 30, uh, middle 60% at $39,833 or just a little bit over a 30% increase, while the top had an average family income of $87,100 or about 39.5%. When you look at average family income, you see that all income groups are rising and they're actually fairly close in how quickly they're rising. Another report on income distribution in Canada found this regarding low-income Canadians. General low income is largely transitory. 82.7% of individuals avoided low income in all years from 2005 to 2010, while 17.3% experienced low income at least once in six years. Fewer were low income for at least four of the six years, 4.1%. Even fewer, 1.5% were persistently low income from 2005 to 2010, 1.5%. Translation from bureaucraties, just, just because you're low income now, doesn't mean you'll stay that way. That may be the leftist thinking that they want you to believe, but it's not reality. They want it to be reality, to start class warfare, to pit people against each other, but in Canada, you can move up the income ladder. 
Over the coming months, you will hear a drumbeat that income inequality is there, and that beat will get louder and louder. There will be calls for more spending, more programs, more ways to take your money and give it to someone else. That's not the answer. Believe me. My family came from the slums of post-war Britain. They lived in Glasgow in places like the Gorbals and the Calton. My parents came to Canada because unlike Britain in those days, well, hard work here meant you could rise up. You want people out of poverty, you want to give them opportunity, give them a chance, not a new government program. Opportunity, that is the Canadian way, not the prescriptions of socialism that you'll hear from Justin Trudeau and Thomas Mulcair starting on Monday. And that's the byline. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. Don't have to go all the way to socialism, but he does want to tax the rich to give to the poor more. Is that the prescription? Peter uh, Morrissey is a professor and economist at the University of Maryland, joins us now out of our studios in Washington. Uh, professor, what say you? Well, there's a couple of basic messages here. One is that somehow or other, the poor and the middle class are getting worse off. If you look at what's in people's households, the objects they possess, the opportunities that are in front of them, they're infinitely better off, or at least many times better off, today than they were when I was 40, 25 years ago, and, and had children, or when I was a child in a working-class neighborhood in Queens, New York, in Archie Bunker land, where my father was a door-to-door -door salesman. I mean, we just have more stuff, we have more economic security, we live better, and, and you just can't but, deny that. Now, the and, other and I'm, point, I'm glad you brought that up. If I can give a couple of, of concrete examples, and, and I'll give credit to this, I took this from uh, uh, Don Boudreaux at uh, Cafe Hayek, uh, a website. He was writing about this and he looked at it, he said, look, I was born in, in 1965 or in the mid-60s and back then Howard Hughes was the richest man in America. And there were things he could do that average Americans couldn't. Now they can. Overnight package deliveries, one of them. Uh, car starters. Talking for a long time uh, to people on the other side of the country. Long distance phone calls used to be very expensive. Now we make them on mobile phones. Home theaters, he had one where he could show movies. Now we can all have big screen TVs and watch Netflix. Air conditioning. When I was a kid, air conditioning was uncommon. Now it's very common. I mean, those are concrete examples. You can't say, well, you know, income inequality is the greatest since the 30s and compare how poor people today are to people in the 1930s. No, you can't. The next thing is that somehow the upward mobility has been stifled. In the words of that liberal MP, the ladder's been pulled out. Those are the kinds of lies liberals have been telling for generations to get ourselves elected. Congratulations, you're a member of parliament. I wish you weren't so cynical because the data doesn't bear you out. In the United States, we just had a study that shows that upward mobility is about the same as it was after World War II. If you are in the bottom tenth of the, of the economy, you have about a 9% chance of getting to the top. That is, if your father or your mother earned in, in the bottom 10%, you have about a 9 or 10% chance of getting into the top yourself. That was the way it was in 1950. It's the way it is today. So that's not there. The third thing is that all these liberal programs help. Look what's happened in the United States. Mr. Obama has convinced young people to mortgage their futures, going to second-rate colleges and community colleges, to take uh, liberal studies of various kinds, that they'll be able to get a better job. Now they're saddled with tremendous debt, working in Starbucks, and they're not better off. But let's look at the big picture. Societies that have embraced these policies, Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, France, have all failed to grow effectively. The United States under Barack Obama has failed to grow effectively, whereas Canada, right across the border, with very similar assets, has grown dramatically and things are getting a lot better in Canada. Now they want to change that in Canada just as they do in New yeah. York City. Well, also, it, in France, hold on, in France, yeah, yeah, not a problem. The, uh, the socialist prime minister has decided that high taxes is not the way to get to growth. He tried it for two years, he's failed, and he's become a Reagan supply cider. I sure wish <laughs> Mr. Obama would get on a jet plane and go to Paris and talk at the epicenter of liberalism, Paris. That's where it was invented. And he's going to tell them, oh, I'm sorry, but we've decided it's a false religion. We're all getting converted to, to, to conservatism.
<laughs> well, uh, you, okay, let, uh, I'll put this to you at the end. Uh, what will the prescription be? Because as I said, next week our opposition parties are going to be saying there's income inequality, we got to have more liberalism to fix it. You're going to have the State of U the Union address, and I've already heard that Barack Obama is going to be delivering the same message from the same pay playbook as Tom Mulcair and Justin Trudeau. So if we need more job growth, and there are areas that we need more job growth here in Ontario and Canada as well, What's the prescription? Is it is it finding ways to make us all earn the same amount of money or is it giving people opportunity? The best social program is a good job. You just can't get around that. No government program ever bet beat a good paycheck. In the United States, we're not doing what we need to compete globally. We have it. We could be producing four million more barrels a day of oil. We could be building the Trans-Canadian Pipeline and be in on the oil boom at three times the rate that we are right now. And we wouldn't have to import any more oil from Saudi Arabia. And guess what? There wouldn't be any young Canadian and American women and men running around the Middle East fighting over some sand because we needed their oil. That's the first thing. The second thing is free trade's great like we have with Canada. It's two-way. With China, it's one way. Finally, the president needs to pick up a baseball bat and go over there and say, look, either you let our products in that are competitive, for example, our good Canadian and American-made automobiles, yeah. Or we're not going to let your stuff in anymore. It's that simple. And the man says, you're holding a two-by-four to my head. What I would say, no, you're wrong. I'm holding a two-by-four with a rusty nail at the end. Because if I shut you off, if I shut you off, prices are going to go up at the Walmart and the Target, and I'm going to have a problem. But if I shut you off, there's going to be unemployment in Shanghai and Beijing, and you won't have a problem. You won't have your head. The bottom line is America... Canada, North America holds the trump cards with, the ch with China, and we are letting them steal our prosperity and leadership in the world. Well, throughout Asia, they're looking to China and saying, hey, they don't have democracy, and they're growing. Oh, it's a bad year. They're growing at 7%. Wouldn't you like to have a few bad Chinese years in Canada? Uh, well, I think we would. Uh, Professor Marcy, thanks so much for joining us. We'll chat soon. Enjoy your uh, income inequality from Obama next week. <laughs> I got to cover it for Fox. Thank <laughs> you.